Good. Um, thank you. It's, it's my pleasure um, to speak on engaging people with plants today. And I'm not going to dwell on um, the, the challenge um, that, that we face because others um, have already. Um, but just to, to touch upon it, the context of, of plant blindness and a general underappreciation of plants, um, an anthropocentric view of animals being more interesting and more important than plants, um, that's the challenge that we face. And combined with that, um, certainly speaking from a, a UK, but I suspect an international perspective, um, there's a bit of a paucity in, in the curricula in education of engaging and interesting plant biology. Um, so it really has been um, sort of um, restricted to growing um, broad bean seeds or potatoes or palm weed, um, or at a more advanced level, um, the process of photosynthesis. Um, but there really is a, a dearth here. There's a the real paucity of, um, of engaging subject matter in, in schools. And teachers and practitioners also struggle with teaching plant biology because they perceive um, that learners um, find plants slightly dull or inanimate in, in some cases. It's not a nice reality, but, but it is a challenge that we face. And so what I'd like to speak about today um, is seeking a new way um, to challenge those perceptions about plants as being passive um, or unimportant or irrelevant to people. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the ways that we've tried to do that and some of the early results that we've, we've got. And I'll start off with this lineup, this motley assortment of botanical rep reprobates. <laughs> um, so um, these, these are plants that some people would scarcely imagine even exist. Um, they're absolutely extraordinary. Um, I'll, I'll talk in a little bit more detail about what they are in, in a moment. And all of them have featured in a series of articles that, um, that we're producing in Plants People Planet as a category called Flora Obscura. And what this category seeks to do is to put a spotlight on some of the weird plant biology that just captures um, people's imaginations. Um, people compare these with um, monsters in, I don't know the programme, but there is one called Stranger Things, um, apparently it's very popular, and people compare these things with, um, with some of the monsters on, on these programmes. They really capture people's imagination and they're a hook to get people in to understand more about the fascinating biology of these plants. Here they are, some photographs of them, and aren't they simply extraordinary? Um, the ones on our left, they belong to the genus Hydnora, um, which is a largely African genus of parasites, so like Rafflesia that we saw yesterday, these are leafless, in many cases rootless parasites that depend entirely on other plants. They attach um, in many cases to the roots of plants and siphon off um, all of their, um, their food from their plants, hence they have no chlorophyll or photosynthesis. Um, so we can think of these as being like plant vampires, if you will. And then in the middle we have this very poorly known genus, um, pronounced in different ways, but let's call it Oxygyna, um, of mycoheterotrophs. So um, as we saw in, in um, Katie's talk yesterday, um, some of these plants that are parasitic on a fungus, um, and hence they also have no chlorophyll or, or photosynthesis. These are tiny little things. Um, the blue ones grow in the subtropical forests of southern Japan, and the orange ones grow in Africa, so uh, uh, they have a disjunct distribution. Very, very little is, is known about these, these curious botanical oddities. And then the next one on the right is Rhizanthella, the underground orchid that grows in southwest Australia. Um, all of these to an extent, but particularly Oxygyna and Rhizanthella, um, really should be the focus of more conservation efforts. Um, they're really quite rare and they grow in fragmented habitats. Little is known about them um, and, and so um, there could be a lot more conservation effort. And so that has also fed into these papers that, that we've published in Flora Obscura. Um, they, they deserve further attention. Um, in terms of engaging people with these unusual plants and their biology, we've explored new ways to do it. And actually, it's, it's really not that difficult. Um, we, we have a very changing landscape in which we publish papers now, as, as we know. So living in the information age, um, in many ways, it's easier now to reach large numbers of people efficiently than it ever has been. Um, so I understand that about 35% of the world's population has a smartphone of, of some description. Many of those people um, will have social media accounts. 
And so we can start to have dialogue um, with many people in real time all over the world about the research that we do, which I think is, is such an exciting opportunity. And so one example that we've um, piloted is producing these bite-size um, infographics which have a digestible amount of information about um, the biology of these plants and then it links it to the, the paper where people can find out more and find out more they do um, because I'll share some of the data later that show just how successful this approach has been to directing traffic to the papers where people are keen to find out um, about this research. Um, another way we can do this is, um, uh, do we have sound, mic via video? Uh, media. just how much so. Um, and botanic gardens, and, and I was so delighted to hear Ned's talk this morning, um, talking about the importance of botanic gardens and arboreta in promoting um, the societal understanding of evolution and um, plant biology in, in general. And it's within our gift to do so because 300 million or so people visit botanic gardens annually every year and engage with the plant collections that we hold. So combined with the, um, the digital scholarship, if we can call it that, that, that I just described, so people learning online, um, we also have the opportunity to engage people with our collections, these living libraries of plants that we contain from around the world. And people come in their tens of thousands to see these. Um, I'm sure you know the Titanarum, Amorphophallus titanum. Um, it flowers very erratically, um, rather seldom, every, every few years. Um, and when it does, it's quite spectacular. It's one of the largest flowering structures um, in the world. And um, people are mesmerised by it. Um, and it causes a, a media sensation whenever it flowers. What a wonderful opportunity to bring people in um, and talk about pollination biology, for, for example. Um, and all aspects of, of biology, including evolutionary biology. So um, people, we found, get very, very excited by tree shrews using pitcher plants <laughs> as toilets. <laughs> I, I didn't realise how excited people would be. Um, so, so we wrote a, a paper um, looking at um, adaptive radiation in pitcher plants. Um, so um, pitcher plants produce... Um, uh, an interestingly varied assortment of um, trap geometries, which appears to be linked to tapping into food from different sources. And in this case, um, as every good allotment gardener knows, manure is good for plants. And so these plants, um, they get their food from manure um, in the form of faecal matter from these tree shrews. Um, so from an evolutionary point of view, these plants grow um, in montane areas where insects, which pitcher plants um, generally um, prey upon, may be scarce. And so in a resource-limited environment, um, these traps have been co-opted into a, a function where they serve effectively as leafy toilets. Um, what a wonderful way to talk about um, natural selection and, and evolution. Um, and indeed, people seem to, to love it. So I think 123,000 people saw this um, picture when it went out on Twitter, and actually many more when Google decided to do a, do a tweet using this, this very picture. So, so um, tremendously um, um, powerful engagement mechanic and we can link that back to the collections that we're able to grow. Uh, so we may not be able to keep tree shrews in, in our glass houses with a, a whopping great Nepenthes oh, Raja. However, um, 
we can grow pitcher plants generally. They're not that difficult to grow in glass houses. And then we can, that's an edging tool to start to talk to people about how these plants evolved. So this one has a bat that lives within its um, pitcher vessel. The, vat, the bat roosts inside the pitcher um, because it's protected from predators. Um, and then the plant um, that's in, invested in this accommodation for, for the bat um, is rewarded with um, urine and, and fertilizer in, in the form of fecal matter from the bats. So it's a wonderful mutualism. We can talk about that mutualism with our collections. So we can um, signpost that, we can um, link it to more information online and to the papers that we publish. People find it very, very exciting. And there are all sorts of plants that people find exciting. Um, these, <laughs> such as these um, very strange ones, the, the one on the left um, we, we were introduced to yesterday, and there are others. There's normally someone who Googles Psychotria alata because they think I've made it up. Um, I haven't, the, the lips plant, which has also got a ruder name that I won't mention. Um, it's, a <laughs> it's a very real thing. Um, some of these are, are difficult to grow, um, others less so. Um, and the relatives of some of these so-called wow plants, we can grow within our collections. And um, people find them very exciting. Um, so the one on the left is a Morphophallus conjac. It's, it's quite an easy one to grow in collections. It doesn't produce um, flowering structures as large as the Titanarum, but they're pretty large nevertheless. And we have them flowering um, annually at, at Oxford Botanic Garden. And every time we do, um, we promote it online and people come through our doors specifically to see these weird and wonderful plants. We then had um, a pelican flower, that lovely Aristolochia in the middle, huge flowering structure, um, one of the largest single flowers um, in, in, in the New World. And um, again, that caused um, a bit of a stir when that one flowered. And then Venus flytraps, even though they're so um, familiar to us all, people are just gripped by them. So I took this little video on my iPhone and then um, some half a million people or so wanted to watch a Venus flytrap closing and to understand how a plant in, in, in very abstract terms can count, um, which was the, the sort of the key message behind, behind this. Um, these these bite-sized messages, and um, you'll forgive me for simplifying them, but they're a way of engaging people, um, getting their attention, and then, and then they want to find out more. And then we direct them to, to where they can find out more information um, about these plants. Um, we can't grow this one yet, this uh, remarkable um, giant pilfering plant parasite, Rafflesia, which is the largest single flower in the world. Um, it, it, it doesn't grow anywhere outside of its native range that, that we heard about yesterday. Um, and so we, we have to resort to making it out of paper mache and wall polyfiller. So this, <laughs> this particular flower um, costs nothing um, to make, um, but is engaged with an awful lot of, of people, um, both where we um, dressed it and put it in our glass houses, um, and then um, this, this, this well-travelled Rafflesia made its way to the, the BBC Breakfast Studio and, and engaged with millions of people. Another wonderful way to, to, to really put a spotlight on extraordinary plants that many people, well, most people haven't seen in the wild, most people can't, um, and many people don't even know they exist. And so it prompts people to think of plants in a different way. As do, <laughs> as do these. These I, I did make up. These are not real, obviously, in some sense. Um, however, um, they, they are mandrakes, in, in case you didn't know. Um, but mandrakes do exist. And um, here is another way that we can build relevance to plants in, in people's everyday lives. What are the things that people find interesting and exciting? Um, Harry Potter is the answer. Um, so... <laughs> so um, so 500 million copies s sold worldwide. Um, it, it's an engagement phenomenon in, in its own right, actually, because it's encouraged children to read who might not have read literature otherwise. Um, so is there a way that we can piggyback onto something that's so tremendously successful? Um, well, one way might be um, to talk about these um, plants that people think are um, uh, that they don't exist, that they're um, mythical, magical plants. And, and actually, um, that's what the literature tells us that people thought in the past. These plants were revered because they have these strangely anthropomorphic roots that look a, vaguely human-like if you dig one up. 
um, combined with very potent narcotic properties. So they were once used as a sort of makeshift anaesthetic. And we actually grow mandrakes in our botanic garden in Oxford, and, and we always have. So we have a list of plants from 1648, and we know that this plant was, was grown then, and, and, and it always has done. Um, and we can talk to people about mandrakes and show them that these plants do exist, and they, they find them funny, they find them exciting, and they want to know more about the plant, and they want to know more about the history of the plant, its cultivation, its medicinal properties, and so we actually um, dug one up in the garden and live streamed it on Facebook. And I think it was seen by some 20,000 people. And we even brought a dog into the garden, which we're not allowed to do, um, because um, the ancient ritual for harvesting a mandrake was to tether it to a dog. Um, and then the dog um, sort of um, hoists it out of the, the soil. And then the demon is transferred from the root of the mandrake, it's a very dangerous undertaking, um, to the dog rather than the pers person who wishes to, to harvest it. So these are some of the, the interesting stories that it's within our gift to, to tell because these are plants, the pitcher plants, the mandrakes, they're already growing in our collections in Oxford Botanic Garden. We didn't, we didn't bring them in specially. They're probably growing in some of yours if, if you work in botanic gardens also. They're there waiting for us to tell these very powerful messages about and to bring people in, bring them on, on board this journey to understanding more and appreciating more about the importance of plants. A slightly more subtle example um, is um, through our static interpretation trail at Harcourt Arboretum, our, our sister site in, in Oxford, um, where we want to talk more about the conservation work that we do. So we have a collection of very rare trees. And some people, um, many people, come to the Arboretum because it's a beautiful, a beautiful place to walk. But they don't appreciate the importance, the natural capital of the site, and also the <coughs> conservation collections that we hold. We know that people um, connect more um, currently with the message of conservation in animals than they do with plants. So one way um, to enthuse people and um, to pique their interest might be to confront them with, with animals and to compare plants with animals that are, are of equivalent conservation concern. So we can tell them this chichibu birch, for example, that we collected seeds of in a, in a remote tract of forest in, in Honshu in Japan, is of equal conservation concern and rarity as a black rhino. You probably knew about the black rhino, but I'm sure you didn't know about the chichibu birch. And we can tell some of those, um, some of those um, stories through our interpretation boards in that way. And I also wanted to talk about um, building relevance and connection with audiences in the research agenda. So this is something I'm very passionate about. Um, and one of the things that, um, that I think is so great, actually, about this conference is that there are some conferences where, let's be honest, we feel like we're talking to ourselves. And, and I don't feel we are in, in this conference. I do feel we've moved the needle on how to engage others with the work that we're doing. Um, I've been doing some research recently with these chaps, um, James, who's an engineer, and, and Finn, who's a, a, a mathematician. And um, we've been looking at the surface properties of plants that are growing in our collections. Um, so in case you haven't gathered, I'm a big fan of pitcher plants. And um, so we wanted to look in, in more detail at the slippery surface that the insects typically fall off, that, that stripy rim at the top. Um, and um, this um, picture on, on, the, on the right um, shows a, a close-up of what that looks like. It's made up of macroscopic grooves, which you can see, um, which is in turn made up of microscopic grooves, which you can't. So it's grooves made up of grooves. It's an anisotropic surface. It's on a gradient. Um, it's slippery because it's infused with a lubricating layer of water because it's a super hydrophilic surface. Um, and we've made various step and trench um, soft polymer replicas of these natural surfaces. Um, and what these, these show in, in short is that when you put droplets on these um, railings, these, these grooves, um, they can be um, directed with absolute precision and control, far more than, than, um, than was previously estimated. You can turn it upside down, you can do whatever you want with it, and you can direct these droplets. And um, these guys find that particularly exciting because um, there may be applications in devices such as microfluidics and anti-fogging devices and things that we use in our everyday lives. Um, I'm excited because it suggests that maybe insects might be driven into the trap in a way that's um, more tightly controlled than considered previously. 
Um, and I'm also excited because there's an, there is another way to, to connect people with plants. We can talk about surface properties in plants, whether it's superhydrophobic surfaces, superhydrophilic surfaces that have inspired materials to soak up oil spills, all sorts of wonderful innovations in engineering and material science that have come from plant collections such as these. And our next project is to look at this um, very iconic and very beautiful feat of botanical engineering. And we're looking at the, the, the mathematics and load-bearing capacity of these very beautiful structures. Um, and it's very easy to engage people with something so beautiful. Um, but what's very exciting about this is that we can engage people in real time. So as we're doing these experiments, we're harvesting these leaves, we're putting weights on them, we're doing mathematical modelling, whatever it is we're doing, we can talk to people about what we're doing and we can involve them in the research agenda as we're doing it, rather than um, from a top-down approach um, giving out a, a paper at the end and saying, ta-da, here it is. Um, we can do that too, but we can also involve people on, on the journey, which I think is very engaging for, for people. Um, so I just wanted to share at the end of the talk some of the, the results we've had from this, this work that we've been doing.